Um, so, hey everyone, thanks for attending. Um, my name is Dylan Morrison. I am on the uh, alliances team at Looker. I run our blocks program. Um, and thank you for coming to this session, which had probably the driest title of any session at this entire event. So I appreciate you coming despite that. Um, we'll workshop it next time. So I'm gonna be talking about a few things today. Um, first, really quickly, I'll go over a quick background on the relationship we have with AWS. Then I'll dive into the more interesting stuff. Uh, well, at least I think it's interesting. Um, cost and usage and security and monitoring for your AWS environment. And then lastly, we'll leave you with some resources, which include step-by-step -step guides on how to get implement all this stuff for yourself, how to interpret the analysis, all that sorts of good stuff. Um, so super quick background on AWS and Looker. Um, as most of you probably know, Looker is in, in database technology. We execute queries directly against a database. Um, we never suck your data into our cloud. We never cube, you don't need, you, you don't need to cube your data, anything like that. Um, so because of this architecture, we're really able to leverage the raw underlying power of Amazon's databases and querying engines better than any other BI tool on the market. And AWS is always making these things much faster, much quicker, so Looker's always getting faster and faster as well. So um, we worked with the AWS product team to come up with what we thought would be four good use cases for general cloud management. So the four we came up with were uh, database administration, optimization, which you guys just heard from my colleague. And then uh, we have security and monitoring and cost and usage are the latter two. So first, uh, I'll answer a question that I'm sure you guys would be wondering is why would you do this in Looker rather than just using the AWS console? You know, the console has a billing interface. It has a CloudTrail security type interface. Why not just do it there? Um, well, there's a few reasons. First of all, uh, raw SQL or SQL on raw data is just much more powerful. It's gonna give you better analysis than the console ever could, much more granular. Um, you can drill down to like the individual line item um, on your individual billing reports or down to actual individual log files from CloudTrail because you're dumping all of this just into, um, in this case we're using S3. Uh, you're able to do much more sophisticated and richer analysis when you're doing it in Looker than the console allows for, more sophisticated types of stuff. You get governance, so uh, governance consistency with all of your metrics. People aren't downloading one-off spreadsheets and doing their like billing reconciliation there. It's all in one place. Everyone's doing it the same way. And then lastly, you get all the benefits of the data platforms. You know things like scheduled emails, triggered alerts, uh, data sharing, permissioning, all that sorts of good stuff. Plus the ability to take action on your data in the Looker interface too. So you can do things like kill an unused instance, um, things like that. Um, so it sounds like everyone, well, I'm hoping everyone knows what Looker blocks are since I run the program selfishly, but they are pre-built dashboards and um, data models built for specific use cases. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at cost and usage, and this is sort of the pipeline we set up for it. We have a cost and usage report, which is coming out of Amazon. It's sent directly to S3 as an S, uh, CSV file, and we just plop Athena on top. We use Athena because there's a, a lot of billing data here and we don't query it that often, so I didn't want to set up an entire you know, ETL process and Redshift and everything. Much easier to just plop Athena on top of S3. And then we apply the block. Um, so I'll talk through what a few of the most popular ways to save money are, some of the most common cost levers for saving money on AWS. Uh, the first is, and definitely the most substantial for the majority of customers we have, and the majority of customers across AWS, is looking at the type of instances you're purchasing. So there's three ways to purchase instances. You can buy a uh, reserved instance, which is paying for an amount of instance hours up front. You can pay on demand, which is exactly like it sounds, just pay as you go. Or you can buy spot instances, which are actually bidding on the excess capacity of unused instances from other customers. Uh, spot's really variable and pretty complex, so I'm not gonna dive into that too much. Um, the takeaway from this, though, is that Reserved instances are about 80% cheaper than on-demand instances pretty much all the time. So it's, you know, it's a significant portion of your costs. Um, naturally, what you'd probably wanna do then is forecast out the amount of hours you'd have over a month and then try to reserve that many hours every single month. Um, on the other hand, you don't wanna buy too many reserved hours because then you lose all that excess capacity and you just lost, you lost that money. Um, so most sophisticated companies usually end up in the ballpark of about 80% uh, reserved instance coverage. 
And if your company is anywhere close to that, then you're, you're doing a really good job. And that's, that's about where you should land. Uh, so one of the great things about AWS is it's really cheap to store data, right? Extremely cheap. Um, you do start incurring some costs when you start moving that data around, though. Um, and that's kind of the second major cost lever is looking at uh, your transfer costs. So generally speaking, the farther you move data, the more it's expensive it's going to be. If you're moving from uh, Oregon to Ohio, I think it's like two cents a gigabyte. From Oregon to Europe, I think it's nine cents. Then Singapore is something like 30 cents. And these are all variable, but um, you can see it's a pretty drastic difference. So you're going to want to localize all of your services as much as possible, your users and your services. And there like, are some arguments we made for why you would want to spread these some services out over multiple regions for things like availability, redundancy, et cetera. So that's kind of just the trade-off you have to make there. Um, last important thing to note here is, uh, oh, excuse me. So on top of how far you move the data, um, the other cost factor is how you're actually moving that data. So if you're doing it just between different AWS users and services within the same availability, availability zone, a lot of times it can be free. If you're doing things out over to the open web, if you're like getting data or moving data through TCIP, then it's about nine cents a gigabyte. So you should really try to minimize how much data is flowing out to the open internet. Um, the last thing is looking at custom tags. This is a big one that Amazon was really bullish on. Um, so Amazon allows you to apply custom tags onto all of your individual resources. So things like, um, you know, if you're a SaaS company, um, like we don't do this at Looker, but I'm just going to use this as, a, as an example. Um, say we host all of our customers on EC2, then we could, you know, tag each of those customers with, say, like a probability score that we get from our demand gen team or something like that. And then we could kind of allocate our costs over the tag, however we'd like to see where we're making or losing money. Um, so maybe if, you know, going on with that example, if we had all of our, you know, a lot, a large portion of our costs, in customers that were low, with low likelihood to convert to actual customers, excuse me, prospects converting to customers, then you know, we probably want to look into that. Why are we spending so much money on these people that are low probability of conversion? Uh, maybe we want to tell our sales team they need to qualify leads better. Maybe we want to like, downsize the types of boxes that we're giving them, whatever the case is. So this one's going to be super contextual. It's entirely based on your business. But it's also really flexible and arguably can be one of the most powerful. So uh, the next thing we're going to look at is security and monitoring. Um, again, we have a pretty similar pipeline set up here, just taking log trails from cloud trail, dumping them into S3, using Athena on top of that, um, because it's large quantity of data, and it's just a lot easier than setting up an entire ETL process. Um, so what is cloud trail? Uh, cloud trail is a service provided by AWS that records every action that's taken in your whole AWS environment. So Anytime someone queries a database, like encounters an error, um, logs into the console, whatever the case is, that's stored as a log file. Um, and it includes things like who took the action, where the action was taken, all sorts of relevant information like that, which makes it really great for a few things. Uh, it makes it great for monitoring the usage and types of usage that you're seeing from your various users and across all of your various services. It's good for governance. It's good for making sure there's no gap hole or gaps or loopholes in your permissioning and authorizations. Uh, it's great for compliance. So AWS actually has a document page where they show how CloudTrail can help meet whatever regulatory requirements there are for your specific vertical. So I definitely recommend going and checking those out. Uh, and lastly, it's, it's really good for just auditing across the board. Um, so you can you know, nail down any troublesome users, find out where errors are occurring, all that sorts of good stuff. Um, so because there's so much stuff, information available with CloudTrail, I'm just going to walk through a few examples. Um, first, we're going to be looking at errors. So on, uh, on the left here, these are going to be very contextual, specific for your business, and you're going to need to have a pretty good understanding of your environment to be able to interpret these, decide the corrective action to take, et cetera, um, as you'd probably expect. So in this example, though, on the left here, we have a chart that's showing the number of errors and type of error by user. Um, so in this case, we can see a, a spike in the access denied error message. 
and it looks like that's coming from trying to create an instance or edit IAM permissionings. So what can I infer from that? Someone is going into, some user is going in either trying to change their IAM permissions um, or they're trying to create new instances and they're not allowed to. So maybe that's something that you know, they're, I need to go give them a slap on the wrist for, or maybe that's something as an IT or DevOps or security professional, I need to go and fix for them because they're doing something, they, they're running into errors where they shouldn't be running into errors, stopping them from doing their job. Um, on the left hand side, we have users just broken out by service rather than user. So here we can see the services that are in, incurring the most errors. In this case, it's Athena and S3, probably because I was using Athena and S3 to build these blocks at this time, and I didn't set up something correct so they weren't able to talk to each other appropriately. Um, and those are just two, two examples I cited here. We have the block comes with a host of dashboards that highlight all of the most common areas where errors are gonna occur. Uh, again, we built this out with the CloudTrail product team, so they helped us highlight all the types of analysis that are really gonna be the most helpful for you guys. All right, another common use case for CloudTrail is looking at logins across your AWS environment. Um, so since potentially thousands, even hundreds of thousands are lo of logins are occurring each day in your console, you know, keep in mind this is not just individual users logging in, it's services that are getting spun up and spun down that need to be doing activity. Um, so because a lot of these are happening every single day, it's important to just try to identify the ones that are outside our normal course of business, right? Things that are irregular and that shouldn't be happening. Um, so we have a few examples here, and again, all this comes with our block. On the bottom left, we're looking at um, the most common IP addresses that had some failed logins. So you can see that we have a ton of logins coming from this one irregular IP address. That might be someone trying to do something malicious. You know, we'd, we'd wanna go inspect that. Uh, we can also look at logins without multi-factor authentication. So people that tried to log in without multi-factor auth or uh, logged in with multi-factor auth and hit an error at the multi-factor stage, you can identify those, those failures, drill in, figure out um, you know, who it was, where they were trying to take the action, why, and then we can take corrective action on that. Um, and then lastly, which is definitely the easiest to interpret visually, is just looking at geolocation. So you can look at where your errors are occurring in the world, or excuse me, where your logins are occurring in the world. If you see something, you know, a lot of logins from an area where you don't have a VPC or any operations or something like that, you know, probably suspect. Um, all right, and last, I'll just leave you some resources. We have these blocks, including all the other Amazon blocks as well that Fabio just spoke to. All in our directory, you can go find them. They include how-to guides to get up and running with all this stuff if you're interested in using the S3 and Athena pipeline. Uh, the block itself, which is just the LookML code, you know, is database agnostic. It's gonna work for whatever database you're throwing all this stuff in. Um, and these blocks also have some nice write-ups about how to interpret all the analysis you're seeing. So what are these visualizations producing? How do I interpret that result and go take the right corrective action because of it? Um, so definitely very easy to get up and running with on your own if you wanna go explore some of this stuff later. Um, we also have a blog on Amazon's big data blog that is almost a copy of the block, which I just wrote up about like how to get up and running and how to interpret these results. And again, highlighting on like the major levers for cost saving and for security. And um, that, is, that is it. I got some time for questions. I got five minutes if anyone has any. If not, I won't be offended. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, good question. Um, so there's a lot of great tools out there that are built, you know, purpose built for cloud monitoring. There's like Cloudability, Cloud Health, Datadog, all that kind of stuff. Um, they, so when we built this, we try to replicate a lot of the analysis that you would see in those kinds of tools, the stuff that's just most critical. Um, because we're going through a database and Looker always uses a database as our source of truth, or in this case, it's, it's S3, um, it's, you know, we do have to, we are issuing queries against that, so it's not gonna be as performant as, say, like Datadog, which is directly plugging into that. Um, they might have a little bit better ability to work with um, certain, like, automated actions and things you can set up within the Datadog interface that'll flow through to AWS, um, which we don't do with Looker, but that's, um, those are kind of, like, fringe things. It doesn't, if I had Looker, I wouldn't go buy Datadog just to do my cloud monitoring. I would just use these tools rather than paying another like you know however much. I would just come in here and just start using this. And 
Yeah, and that was largely the intention, you know, as we want to help people explore use cases that maybe they aren't thinking about or at least help show other people in your organization how they can be using Looker if they aren't already using a tool. So if your IT team, your DevOps team, your security team, if they're not using one of those cloud tools right now, they're doing a lot of stuff manually, you can, you're already paying for Looker, just get them using these blocks, using these resources, and then you get rid of the need to buy separate applications.